Welcome back to Around the Farm. I'm your host, Clint Chaffer, and we're going to be talking about all things ag. Today, we're going to be looking at seeds and planting data and how using a seed treater can ruin your favorite pair of jeans. Our guest today is a former seed dealer, a digital farming expert, and a current Climate Field View employee. Stay with us as we talk about what it takes to get your seeds to your farm, how to get the most out of your spring planting, and the importance of gathering all the data when you're out there in the field. I'd like to welcome Tanner Dunn. Tanner, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, thanks, Clint. I appreciate the invite here. Yeah, well, tell us, uh, t- tell our listeners a little bit about yourself. Absolutely. So, grew up on a, a grain farm in West Central Illinois. Uh, we actually raise corn and soybeans, about 1,100 acres. We also do a hog production operation, so we call it uh, wean to finish operating, and uh, we turn over about 10,000 hogs a year. So um, I have since moved on um, to St. Louis here recently with Climate Field View. I'm still actively involved in the farm in the past couple years, uh, but it's just a, a good transition down here to St. Louis overall. Nice, nice. Well, two things that I have here. So first off, Northwest Illinois, Seton, Illinois, right? Yeah, born and raised locally, uh, a big 200-person uh, town. Hey, there you go. You know, it's uh, kind of funny. We had uh, Mr. Brian Boak uh, on episode one. I promise we will start getting uh, getting talent from outside of Seton, Illinois. But hey, that's where we're going to start uh, start this podcast at. You know, second thing, why am I just now finding out that you raise this many hogs? Why do I keep buying bacon at Mercer Market? <laughs> so, one, surprisingly, I'm surprised you can't smell it for as close <laughs> as we are. Uh, but two, yeah, it's just, uh, it's another side production for us. The grain is, uh, probably the sole income, but it's also a good supplement to our farming operation. Nice. Nice. No, that's, uh, it's important, uh, to, to, to have all those different pieces that can really roll into the operation there and, uh, and diversify yourself, uh, helps through some of those different times, uh, throughout agriculture here. So. I know you work for Climate Field View today, but uh, for this this particular podcast, I'd like to, you know, kind of go back to, to when you were uh, being a seed dealer and, and kind of talk about some of the challenges just around that that whole piece from ordering to, to, you know, taking delivery into the seed shed to treating the, the seed to then ultimately delivering it out to the farmer uh, and just some of those overall challenges. So let's first off just by starting of, of looking at just a typical day during the spring, uh, you know, a, as you're talking to farmers and working, uh, working with them, just take us through a, a standard day that you would have. Yeah, in the springtime, we had a, there's a lot of moving parts going on. Um, not every farmer starts planting at the same time. Not every farmer's doing tillage at the same time. Everybody is working on different schedules, and you kind of got to flex to that schedule depending on when they're operating and then when also when the weather's going to cooperate with you. So a typical day, you're, you're making phone calls. You're seeing who's going to be in the field. Um, do they expect to, one, maybe plant the, the product that I'm offering to them? And then three, logistically, how are we going to get that to them? So there's a lot of things happening from getting seed loaded, getting it treated, getting it to the field. Is uh, logistically the farmer going to get it from you? So a lot of communication be- between me and my other partner, and then also between us and the farmer on who's going to do what. What uh, you know, you talk about communication. Uh, it's always interesting to look at uh, how that's changed. I mean, is that phone calls, text messages, emails, or all of the above? It, it's all the above, honestly. Not every farmer is big in the technology. Uh, all of them can't text. All of them don't like to talk on the phone when they're the machine. Sometimes you're driving down the road and you see uh, somebody in a tillage tool. You'll just stop. You'll get out. You'll stand at the end of the field. You'll wave them down. And then uh, you'll have that conversation and you'll plan that for maybe three days later. So um, they'll remember that. Um, I'll take a note of it. And, uh, and hopefully it executes like uh, we plan to. Now, when uh, when are you typically taking the the seed orders? Is that happening in the spring? Is it is it happening you know in the in the previous fall or throughout the winter or just kind of all the time? Yeah, so really the the initial seed order really begins probably um, six months before from now and actually rewind back to probably October November. Um, that's when we really like to lock down our seed orders as much as possible. Still going through the new year into February probably. Um, by the end of February, we're pretty much everything's locked in in place. Um, and then we look for for seed delivering, and then uh, also getting it logistically into our shed as well. A lot of a lot of moving parts then. Yeah. Oh yeah. There's uh, between us and working with um, our our dealers in in St. Louis that are providing us the logistics, and then us just communicating that back to the farmer. There's a, a ton of moving parts. Now you know you talk about you know having that seed order ahead of time. Uh, and having everything wrapped up by, you know, let's say February, do you know supply at that point in time? Do you know, you know, what you're going to get 
into your seed shed or, or at least a rough amount? Yeah, so we, we hope we do, um, but we all know uh, not everything is produced the way we, we wish it would be. So we have a pretty good idea in October, November, but that's really before all the, the crop production has been brought into all these plants and been sorted out, graded, and treated, and then put into production bags. So it, it really fluctuates. You might put an order in in October, November. Supply actually comes out in January, February, and then you realize you have maybe a shortage or a surplus of that said hybrid. Nice. And when you have, you know, let's say a, a shortage of it or maybe a surplus uh, and, you, and you end up getting more than uh, what, uh, what you thought you were going to get, uh, does that change the conversation with that farmer? Are you going back to him and, and either taking bags out or pushing bags to him? Uh, how does that look? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the worst conversation you want to have with a customer is, hey, I understand you order 200 units of this product. It's a hot new product. Unfortunately, we can only get you 100 of it. So at that point, you're trying to swap for varieties. Um, you might be looking at different bag costs, so you're trying to financially change some things around for them. And they had an expectation set at that point, and you kind of you take that away from them. So you try to, to offer up maybe the customer, you know, you want to make them happy at the end of the day. So you might make something right with them, um, work a little bit, get a different product in there, uh, work on possible discounts with them, um, but just make it right with the customer at the end of the day. Now, I mean, we, we we're talking a lot about uh, about the seeds, but uh, there's there's a lot of other products then that uh, that you're looking at as well. I mean, when especially when it comes to like seed treatments and and different additives, uh, how, how does that come into effect? And and when do you start having those conversations with uh, with the farmer? Yeah, so seed treatment. There's, I mean, if you look at a list, there there's tons of different options uh, specifically for soybeans. Um, but when you talk about shortages and surpluses, you go back to what treatments come on that that hybrid because there's different packages that are available for that. And you might get shorted one package, but there might be an availability of another hybrid for a different treatment. So you might be swapping that in and talking to the customer and seeing if that fits their operation and needs. Um, but when it comes to soybeans, depending on what kind of a weather you're having in the springtime, it might change how you impact your decision on what treatment you want to put on your seed. Now, and is, is all of that seed treated at your facility, or does some of it come in the bag already? So all corn is treated at the production facility and then delivered to us, um, so we don't treat any corn. Um, however, all of our soybeans that run through our plant and our operation is treated by us d- um, directly in the shed. And when, when do you start treating? Uh, I mean, does that start happening as soon as you take delivery, or is that more when the farmer's getting ready to go out and plant? Yeah, so delivery of soybeans, um, we had six bulk bins outside of our operation that we would fill throughout probably December to February time frame. And then we would actually try to treat it as quick as possible right before the guy is going to plant. So we would actually, in theory, we would like to do it in March. But we think, whether it's right or wrong, that if we treated it right before it was planted, we're going to have the longest residual with that chemical. And then if we also had like bioag treatments on it, we're going to have the longest life for those microorganisms in the, in the, in the soybean seed. I would imagine trying to do that, uh, what I'm going to call just-in-time treatment, right, would uh, probably have bring its own headaches along with that. I mean, just from, again, a time frame and, and delivery aspect. Uh, t- tell us a, a little bit about uh, that, that whole process there. Yeah, so for the customer, it's great. But for the working hours, it doesn't always play in nice to your work schedule. So at the end of the day, we want the best product for the customer in the ground. Um, and we realize it's going to take during those April and May time frame, we're going to spend a lot of hours in the shed. And whether that's coming in at 6 in the morning and treating for a few hours because we know what customers are going to be running that day. We'll get their batches treated through, delivered, and then we might take a break and sort some corn, go out and visit customers during the day. And then once guys are kind of, we've got that last delivery done for the day and we know those customers are going to have enough soybeans to finish out planting that day, we'll come back in and we'll treat another batch for that customer that's going to get going in the morning again. So it's kind of a cycle twice a day you're treating, running the treater. If we have rain days, it's a great time to catch up and we can bulk treat for a full day and get a, you know, a thousand units treated at a time. And that really saves us a lot of time in the end if we can get a couple breaks in there. Is there a big learning curve to doing doing the treating? There absolutely is, yeah. I, uh, when my first couple of weeks, I had a lot of experiences um, that I don't know if my, my old partner even knew at the time because I tried hiding a lot of it. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, there's always Here comes stories. the truth. <laughs> So talking about some of those experiences, uh, I know there's one that, you, that you've told me before that, uh, that just made me chuckle a little bit, and uh, I think it involves maybe a, a pair of jeans getting ruined, I think maybe even a, an, Illinois, an Illinois polo, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, t- tell us about this. Share this with the listeners. 
Yeah, so first couple weeks on the job, uh, I'm actually not even officially hired yet because I'm still in college, and I know I'm coming into this role, but I, I didn't have a lot of time out of school at that point, so I was coming back working a couple days a week, and I was, I sh- I was shown how to use the treater um, when somebody's with me, but I've never ran it by myself, and, and finally I got kind of turned loose, and the treater's running that day, and I'm two weeks into this job, and stuff starts beeping, and I, I have no idea what's going on. Um, stuff, beans start flowing out of places I've never seen beans come out of. I go to the treater. There's an emergency stop button. I click the button. Unfortunately, the pump to the treater doesn't stop. Everything else does, and there's a funnel that captures kind of, if it gets plugged up, it captures what's, what's jamming it. So, you know, instantly I go over to that, and I start unscrewing it, not knowing the, the pump was still on. I take that screen off, and it looks like somebody dumped a can of red paint on me. I had, I had nice jeans on. I had my favorite Illini basketball pullover on, and it's all ruined. So I learned one big lesson. Never wear something nice when you're treating soybeans. I don't care. It's just like painting. You don't think you get anything on you, and as you're trying to be particular, you have gloves on, and you look at the end of the day, and it's covered in you. So, yeah, it was a big lesson learned in my first couple of weeks. So those jeans became my permanent soybean treating pants. Nice. Nice. That story would have been even worse if it was an Iowa Hawkeyes pullover, but uh, <laughs> luckily it wasn't that. So so that uh, makes that story a little bit nicer there. So one of the other things, you know, you talked about uh, running these into uh, into bulk and, uh, and, and being able to deliver them out to the farmer. How many farmers still order bags from you and instead of, you know, boxes or the, or the large bags? Yeah, so out of our operation, we probably only had about three out of our 30, so a pretty small percentage that would order any bags. Um, but it, ironically, we did bring in quite a few bags for the end of the season because if a guy's starting to, to wind down planting soybeans, we didn't want to bulk treat boxes for him if he didn't need many um, bags to finish up. So at that point, we would just swap out bulk beans, take in maybe five bags of beans um, that you can just dump out of the bag. So at that point, you don't have to worry about logistics of having soybeans left in the planter. You don't have to vacuum it out at the end of the year. Um, you're trying to, to use the least amount of seed at that point as you can. Most of your farmers have a tender that they're, that they're using? Yeah, I would say 80% do. And then that other percentage um, that don't, we actually had tenders of our own that we would loan out to our customers. So it was kind of a service we provided. And even customers that had their own tenders, we would actually bulk deliver um, using our tender to their fields for logistics. If we could maybe help them out because they didn't have a hired hand that day, we could go drop off that, that tender of ours, drop it in a field, unload into theirs, take our tender back. So it was kind of a a mutual um, relationship with, with how we worked with our customers. So directly to the field deliveries then? Yeah, we were, we were always, most of our guys, we would take, um, deliver straight from our, our operation there in, in Seton, and then we would drive it to the field. We would unload into their tender, um, deliver it on site so they didn't have to worry about sending somebody to our um, shed maybe 20 minutes away. We would provide that service to them, so a little extra, a um, little benefit for them. Another part of, of getting ready for, for planting is also, you know, working with them on a digital aspect and, and working with their data and, and I would assume, uh, you know, getting planting prescriptions and things like that ready. Uh, did you guys provide that service as well? Yeah, so, so FieldView is actually incorporated into our operation. And, and as the dealer, we would want to go, you know, take their corn and deliver that maybe a month in advance. Well, at that point, it was another touch point for us to maybe go out and load their prescriptions for them into their planner. If they needed an update for their, their iPads, we would update their iPads for them, um, really get everything loaded for hybrids. If they had prescriptions, we would make sure it's going to execute um, like planned when they hit the field. If they had software updates they needed done on their monitors, we would do that for them as well. So anything to get that customer ready to hit the field running um, was our goal and try to get that done probably a month in advance. So you talk about doing that uh, about a month in advance. How much of that is done just on the fly in the season, you know, I mean, with, with changes and, and things of that nature? Yeah, we all like to have a plan, um, but does, plans don't always go to according. Uh, so a lot of it, once you actually get to the planner, because um, it's hard to simulate planting if you're not actually in the field. So when you go back out there and you got to relearn the whole monitor over again, so you're trying to figure out how to, one, unfold the planner because you did it 300 days ago and you don't remember uh, and then two, you, you don't even know how to go in and enter your, your variety into the machine at that point. So it, it's a learning curve all over again. If you can help that customer through that learning curve, um, it's pretty important for them. So talking about data and working with farmers to, to whether it's getting their prescriptions in and things of that nature, when it actually comes to 
you know, inputting their hybrids and making sure that they're collecting the right data in the field. Um, as a dealer, how, how do you how do you explain the importance of that? And then also, how do you just work with them to make sure that gets done? Yeah, so at the end of the year, I mean, they're looking at yield analysis and seeing how all, all of these hybrids performed. Um, however, we got to rewind several months when you're planting and remind them that, hey, guys, if we don't enter this planting data in and we don't know where that hybrid's at, how are we going to analyze it at the end of the season? So when you talk about it in that aspect, it really it, it kind of hits home with them, and, and they understand whether they're running the planter or not. Um, let's try to set up the guy that is um, for success and try to get everything in a manner where it's easy to click and maybe enter hybrids, uh, maybe enter that prescription, have it already done for them. So when they get into that field, they just click the field and everything's done, and they can execute that plan. Um, because, you know, four or five, six months down the road when you want to analyze it, um, you have good hybrid performance and placement at that point. And that really impacts even future decisions, right? I mean, you want to make sure that, uh, I mean, some of these tools that we have, you know, go from from year to year uh, with uh, with field performance. I mean, that, that can impact even later on than even just that one season, couldn't it? Oh, of course. If you're looking at what you're going to choose for another hybrid for the, the following season, well, how are you going to make it off a decision if you didn't have the data to, to make that decision from the previous year? Um, you kind of look back on it as if you're at your son's baseball game and you're, it's his first hit of the game and, or of the year or his career and you're not, you didn't hit the record button, you can't go back and have him redo it for you. Um, so that's a good analogy. I think you can, you can kind of tell them, and if they have kids, they can kind of relate to that. And then, and then it kind of hits home for them. So, you know, one, one last thing that I'd like to, uh, like to ask you here, Tanner is, you know, you, you've, you've had this, uh, experience where you've come from a farm, you've worked with, uh, with a seed dealer. And now, now, of course you're down here in St. Louis, uh, on the climate field view team. What do you miss most about working with farmers, uh, you know, back in Seton and, uh, and, and helping them with their seed? I would definitely have to go back and say um, it's definitely all the relationships you build with the guys. I mean, you spent three years, um, you're a young kid out of college, you didn't have a ton of experience, and these guys gave you a shot with their livelihood and their farm, and you become friends with these guys. You get to know their wives, you get to know their kids, um, you're with them probably more than your significant other majority of the year. Um, so at that point, you're just, you become naturally best friends. And, and when you move down and move away from them, uh, yeah, you're a phone call away, but you're not a, a truck, a 20 minute truck ride away. So yeah, you, you kind of miss those relationships because you, you do miss a lot of friends. Uh, you know, with your, with your current role in field view, do you get to work with, uh, any of your past customers? Absolutely. That's part of the job. Why, why I took it, I guess, because yeah, I'm not on the farm and going to visit them in person, but my job, they're still using our product at the end of the day. And so when they have an issue or a question, they can still come straight to me and I can answer that for them. No, that, uh, that is great to hear. I mean, the, uh, you know, like you stated, relationships in this business are, are very important. So now back on the, on the seed delivery side, um, you talked about, you know, moving soybeans out with the, with the seed tender. Uh, how, how are you delivering corn? Are, are they picking that up or are you delivering corn out to the farmer? Yeah, so majority of our corn was actually delivered from us to the farmer, and we would try to get it a month in advance. However, a lot of places or a lot of farmers do not have the storage that is that can store it safely and, and secure it maybe for that last month. So we would actually store it in our shed until maybe two weeks before planting, and then at that point we were loading it on pallets um, on a gooseneck trailer and then delivering that to the farm directly to them. Now, when you say delivering directly to the farm, is that, you know, during planting, a little bit before planting? Is it to the field or to to a storage place that they have? Yep. So all the above, but majority is actually going to go directly to their shed. And then if there's any last minute shifts in season, we would probably deliver to the planter at that point um, and then help logistically try to get the other seed we delivered back from them. Um, But anything to make them have their plan executed right is what we'll, we'll shift our focus to. You know, as I think about, uh, you know, throwing a few pallets of corn on a, on a flatbed and, and delivering that out, that's, uh, that's pretty precious cargo, right? Uh, ever had any, uh, any hiccups on that and uh, left some seed on the ground? Yeah, it's like he already knew what I was going to go into here. But, uh, <laughs> Crazy but yeah, we had, <laughs> we had a pretty good story. Three years ago, there was a product that was probably the best product in the nation at that point. And it was very, it was very short supply. We had a lot of cuts of it. And it was just kind of precious gold at that point. Um, We had about 30 units of this product left, and a customer was actually, he was on his last field, and and he wanted to test it. And we're like, hey, 
if you wait 30 minutes, we'll load this pallet up. We'll deliver it right to the field. We'll dump it into your bulk fill planter for you, and we'll have you plant this hybrid. And he's like, sounds like a deal. So we're running around, um, me and my partner at that point. Uh, we're trying to get into the truck. We're, we're loading it on the back. Instead of taking the, the flatbed, we're just like, we'll load it in the bed. We'll take it. It'll be a lot quicker. Um, we're exceeding the speed limit going down the road by a little bit. <laughs> and we come around a curve, and all I can see, I'm not driving, thankfully, I'm just in the passenger seat, but in the corner of my eye, I look back and I just see four bags go flying off the back. And I turn around and it looks like an explosion of seed corn on the highway behind us. And my partner looks at me and some choice words were said at that point. And we stopped, uh, came back, and needless to say, there was nothing left of that seed left. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of gravel, a lot of picking up with a five-gallon bucket coming back. Um, thousands of dollars just uh, rained out on the ground right there. Oh, man, that's just... Uh... That's just a bad day, but uh, I, I think that's I think that's happened to a lot of us, uh, especially uh, you know when you're in a hurry and uh, trying to get that crop in the ground. It's uh, it's easy to make mistakes like that. Yeah, absolutely, and and unfortunately for that customer, he only got uh, 26 bags of that hybrid for that year. <laughs> hey, you got to try it though, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, you could say that. You know, I think uh, I think you're also telling me just just one more uh, quick funny story here, but I know that you were talking about uh, y- your dad getting. Uh, uh, some soybeans from you that uh, may not have been completely on the clean side. So uh, how about uh, how about you share that story with us? Along with that treatment story, this happened in the first few weeks of my my time on the job. And, you know, you're always in a rush. You're trying to get as much done as possible, and, and you forget things. And on these containers that we bulk load the soybeans into, there's slides on the bottom of them. Um, I got in a hurry. I opened it. I cleaned out the, the bottom of the container. Forgot to close it, took the forklift, put it back underneath the treater where the beans come out, and thought nothing about it. Jumped off, kept doing what I was doing. The The beans came into the box. I went to go lift that box up when it was done, and I forgot to close the slide. So I lift up, and I just see beans start spilling everywhere on the floor. I mean, I lost about half of this container, so about 20 bags worth. And I'm freaking out. I don't know what to do. And uh, so I started sweeping them up and dumping them back in the box. The ground's dirty from all the treatment and the dust that's going on. And so it looked like somebody took some treated beans and then sprinkled on some dirt on top of it and mixed in a little black dirt on top of that. So it was just a good mixed bag. And then when I was like, well, I'll put this in my dad's name because if anybody's going to complain, I can take it from him. And, <laughs> and he did. So, you know, a week later when I, I dropped those off, he dumped them into the planter and he called me and he's like, what did you guys do to these beans? Is this a new treatment? And I started laughing. <laughs> I was like, yeah, it's all natural, organic, you know, straight from the ground. So, yeah, it, was, uh, it wasn't a, mo- a proud moment in my career, but, uh, but stuff happens. You know, we all got through it. The, the beans grew that year. So I don't think there was an impact. Eh, no harm, no foul, right? That's right. So going back to the technology piece, uh, when farmers call you up and are asking you, you know, uh, during the planting season as they're in the field uh, about different, whether it's seeds or scripts or treatments, uh, what product do you use or what kind of tools do you use to, to help them through those kind of decisions? Yeah, we, uh, we always came back with field view, um, whether it was troubleshooting with planters if they're in the field, if they're asking about varieties, um, just asking about logistics in general. Uh, we would always go back and check their field view accounts at that point. Um, a big feature for us was remote view. I couldn't always be at 10 planters at one time, but if one customer was seeing a certain issue, I could just pop in, open up the iPad, see where he's at, see what he's viewing on his screen, and then use that as an advantage and save me you know, a round trip for an hour for just to go tell him to click one button. So it was a huge advantage for us, and, uh, and, and really it, it saved a lot of time on the road that it saved us. Did, did you see farmers, you know, utilizing that data and seeing some of that come through and then correlating that back to the size of the seed, whether it's flats or rounds or how they have their planters calibrated? Did, did, did any of that go back into that? Yeah, so we were always looking, evaluating planter performance after the seed was put in the ground. I mean, you can only do so much when you're planting it because once it's in the ground, it's in the ground. Um, but definitely seeing performance outside of that, whether it's maybe your singulation was affected by a certain variety of seed because of the size of it. Uh, maybe your spacing was affected on how fast you were planting at that time. Were your scripts executing at that point? We can go back and do stand counts. So we can really do in-season evaluation, but a lot of it, once it's done, it's done. And then we'll come back you know, a month later and start evaluating how that planter pass was. Really, I mean that kind of wraps into a, a, I mean, a full service that you're that you're providing. I mean, it, it really sounds like you're you're helping that farmer 
plan, you know, really, I mean, kind of put their, put their planting plan together, uh, execute on that planting plan, and then really looking at the at kind of the results afterwards. Uh, is that a fair statement? Yeah. I mean, the farming industry, it's all about relationships at that point. And as many touch points as you can have with a customer, I, I thought it was beneficial. So whether it was just walking a field, looking, everything looked fine, but you were just out there and making sure it was fine. Um, just evaluating, we thought the planter did a good job, but let's double check and make sure it did, you know, a month later. So at that point, you're messing with the guy's livelihood and, uh, and anything you can help to do that is I think very beneficial for them and, and for their operation. Well, I know that you, uh, you sold seed to my old man and, uh, he always had, uh, had nothing but good things to, uh, to talk about you and, uh, and the service you provided. So yeah, with Doug Chaffer, it was never a 10 minute conversation in the combine or the planter. You might as well book <laughs> about two hours of your day for him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can, I can contest to that. So, well, Tanner, I'd really like to thank you for, for coming in and, uh, and, and, and talking to us and sharing your experiences throughout your time of being a seed dealer. Uh, so, so thank you for coming in and, and giving us your time. No, I appreciate you having me in. I'd also like to thank our listeners. And remember, Around the Farm is brought to you by Climate Field View. Join us next time to understand how your field may need a prescription that your pharmacy can't prescribe. And don't miss any episodes, so be sure to subscribe, either on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcasts. And we'll see you around the farm. Around the Farm.